You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. It's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go, it's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know. Hello everyone, and welcome to History of the Great War, episode 104, the first of 2017. I would like to thank everybody for their kind messages that they have sent my way over the last month as I battled a newborn baby, a battle which I believe she is winning handily. I would also like to thank all of the podcast Patreon subscribers, especially those who have been with us since the beginning last year. Last year saw the release of 12 Patreon-exclusive episodes, and this year promises more interesting topics every month, so if you cannot get enough of my voice you can head over to patreon.com slash historyofthegreatwar to find out more about the Patreon campaign. And you can also check out an episode that I just released for everybody on the normal podcast feed on some of the neutral countries of Europe, which was previously only available for Patreon supporters, so you can see what you would be getting. For this episode, we will be starting off the year with a few random topics that are from 1916 that we did not get to before. These are items that were always on my list, but that I never could feel like they needed an entire episode to discuss, but they were also constantly pushed to this nebulous later, which never really came. These topics are the death of Lord Kitchener, first Earl of Kitchener, in June 1916, the British draft of early 1916, which was quite the momentous occasion for the British because they'd never done anything similar to it before, And then we will close out today by talking about some of the peace proposals that began to float around Europe in one form or another in 1916. None of these proposals would get very far, but they would start to appear with increasing regularity in late 1916 and into 1917. Even though they were unsuccessful, I believe their simple existence and their persistence tells us something about the mindset of some of the politicians around Europe as the war entered its third year. We start with Kitchener. I feel like we've not talked much about Kitchener in quite some time now, so let's take a bit to review who he was and what he's been doing in his position in the British government since the beginning of the war. I find him to be one of the more interesting characters from the war years, because he feels so much like a man out of time. Kitchener had made his name in colonial conflicts that were typical of British military officers in the 19th century. The two biggest feathers in his cap was the victory at Omdurman and the role he played during the Boer War. These made him a military hero for the people of Britain, and this was nurtured and intensified by the British press, who were always eager to tell fantastic stories of military men abroad. While these experiences served him well in all of his colonial dealings, they did not provide through the same level of benefit for the large continental conflict that he found himself controlling in 1914. With his position based in London and not in India or Egypt or some other far-flung colony, he found himself working closely with other members of the British government. All of the bureaucracy was not his strong suit, and it was not something he had a ton of experience dealing with, at least at the level that he found in London. This was probably his greatest weakness, because in many other ways, he had things quite right, or at least more correct than many other military and political leaders at the time. He was convinced from the start that this was going to be a long war, with Russia and France being roughly equal to Germany in a conflict. And because of this, he took the long view on what the British Empire should be doing. He knew that they had to increase the size of their army, even if it meant the long process of training men without any military experience. His goal was for the army to reach its maximum strength in 1917, so that it would be hitting the peak of its strength right as the French and Germans were running out of steam. 
As it turned out, this would be almost precisely what happened. Much like other military commanders that we have discussed along the way, Kitchener had a pretty stringent routine that he followed during the war, although it was nothing like Joffre or Haig. He would arrive at the war office at 9 a.m. and worked until dusk, with, only a, with the only break being for lunch and maybe an occasional tea. He was on this schedule Monday through Friday and sometimes on Saturday. He made it a point to deal personally with all the major problems that came to his desk, which was often deep in papers. He was also slow at making decisions. He liked to think about the situation and analyze possible options far longer than others in the British government. To their eternal consternation, by the way. At the end of the day, which generally arrived at 8 p.m., he would often go into the Beefsteak Club across Trafalgar Square, where he would eat at the large communal tables. Just like everybody else, the first two years of the war were a challenge for Kitchener. It started right from the beginning, when Kitchener had to rush to France on August 24th, after Sir John French had told him that he was going to retreat all the way behind Paris. This would have separated the British and French armies at a critical point, and would have put the French in a rough spot, tarnishing British prestige in the process. While at the time this seemed like it could have caused the Entente to lose the war, in reality, if you look at the Battle of the Marne, it probably just results in the same outcome, even if the British were not there. The Germans were simply at the end of their ropes. But that's like a counterfactual for a different day, and you'll find different opinions from everybody. But if it would have went through, it almost certainly would have changed the relationship between the British and the French. The French would have definitely seen that the British had abandoned them in their time of need. Even if it would not have mattered, it did not stop everybody from panicking and Kitchener rushed off to France to order French to stay in the line. This was just the first of the big panic moments, and the first trip to France for Kitchener, and there would be many others. For Kitchener, 1915 was a year of declines, in both power and in declining prestige among his colleagues. He was, in general, against sending many British troops or supplies away from the Western Front, instead wanting to hoard them at home as long as possible. The fact that Gallipoli happened at all, and would be as big as it was, was indicative of the declining power of Kitchener among the political leaders of Britain. At the beginning of the war, Kitchener's word had been the final say in anything military-related, and the other ministers were okay with that. However, by early 1915, this was no longer the case. Kitchener still believed that the British should conserve their strength and only do very limited operations elsewhere to maintain the critical hold on Europe and the oil in the Middle East. In early 1915, while the other men on the War Council would accept this, there were already, already rumblings against it, if not open revolt quite yet. This all changed in May, when the Shell scandal hit. Up to this point, the production of munitions had been under Kitchener's purview. That meant that when the Times reported that the BEF did not have enough ammunition on hand to properly attack, the responsibility for that fell directly on him. This article was encouraged by Sir John French, at least partially to find a fall man other than himself, to blame for the failures of the 1915 attacks. After the story hit, Asquith blamed Kitchener for the whole mess, since it had shaken public faith in the entire government, since he had been assured just a month before that there was enough ammunition to go around. Asquith even wanted to leave Kitchener out of the coalition government that was formed after the Shell scandal in late May, but this was simply not possible. Regardless of any administrative problems, Kitchener still had this complete confidence from the public at large, a critical commodity to have in a government with the war continuing to drag on and on and continuing to pull Britain deeper into its abyss. However, Asquith did do something. Well, it was pretty much the only thing that he could do, and he started to chip away at Kitchener's powers. The Shell controversy gave him the perfect excuse to remove the production of munition from Kitchener's portfolio, and he did this by creating the Ministry of Munitions, which was probably a good call at this stage, because it allowed more focus to be put on manufacturing, something that was desperately needed. This would be the first, but not the last, of the powers that were pulled out of Kitchener's office. In this case, it would be put under the control of Lloyd George, who really did not like Kitchener at all. 
Lloyd George was constantly trying to reduce Kitchener's power, with the eventual goal of getting him out of the war office entirely. In the final few months of 1915, Kitchener became more and more disconnected from his work and from his political colleagues. The split was mutual, though, with Kitchener disliking working with them just as much as they disliked working with him. The situation continued to deteriorate until October, when Kitchener did not have really any allies left on the cabinet. However, the men on the cabinet still did not believe that they could just boot him out. So instead, they sent him on a mission to Eastern Mediterranean to sort of look at the troops, you know, glad hand, stuff like that. This allowed Asquith to take control of the war office while Kitchener was gone, and it also allowed Kitchener to do what he really did best, wander around the world playing, a bit, uh, playing the bit of the big war hero. When he got back to London, he found that more power had been taken away from him with the appointment of General Robertson as the controller for military strategy. This, of course, hurt Kitchener's pride more than a little, but it was greatly helped by the fact that he and Robertson actually got along quite well, with Kitchener judging Robertson to be quite skilled. They did not always agree on everything, but Kitchener would always support Robertson in front of the cabinet, which provided a much-needed united front for the military. Even with his power being slowly stripped away, Kitchener was determined to stay on until the end of the war, and this probably would have been possible with his new reduced powers. In early 1916, he was going to go to Russia to discuss that country's war effort and the munitions and financial support that it needed from Britain. It's not crazy to think that he, if he would have stayed on the government, if he would have survived his trip to Russia, throughout 1916 he would have played a big role in liaising with America when it entered the war in 1917, giving him plenty to do until the armistice where again he probably would have been one of the British representatives. It all could have went quite well, except for the fact that on June the 5th, shortly after his ship left Scapa Flow on its way to Russia, it hit a German mine and sank. Only 12 men from the ship were rescued, and Kitchener was not among them. There was mourning throughout the empire. Kitchener was a national hero, in a way that few men have been ever since, and as cold as it seems to say, with the benefit of hindsight, his passing preserved that status in a way that a long post-war life may not have. At the end of the day, he was one of the last few men who had made his name in the age where colonial heroes were larger than life, gallivanting around the globe, conquering the world for the British Empire. Perhaps his greatest legacy was the recruitment posters all over Britain, with Kitchener pointing to the reader saying, Your country needs you. He would forever be the face of the masses of British volunteers who answered the call in the early years of the war. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons. Any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Thank you. 
Of all of the belligerent nations, Britain was the only one that did not have a conscription system implemented at the beginning of the war. This went part and parcel with their professional army, which held them in good stead in the small colonial wars that they were used to participating in. However, when it became clear that they needed more men, they had one choice, to ask for volunteers. This was initially very successful, and when they called for 100,000 men, they got a number that vastly exceeded that. Many of these volunteers were fueled by patriotism, and a concern that they didn't, if they waited too long, they would miss the adventure. They would go through a year of training, give or take, and would end up on the battlefield of the Somme, or somewhere else, in 1916. While there were a good number of volunteers, hundreds of thousands of them, numbers of new volunteers rapidly began to decline. This presented the British government with a problem. The British had no history of any kind of compulsory military service, but as the summer of 1915 came to a close, it was a specter that hovered over the head of the entire government and nation, as something that might have to be done, even if the people did not want it. Before a draft was initiated, though, there was one final attempt to get enough volunteers, and this was suggested by Edward Stanley, the 17th Earl of Derby, and the idea would get his name on it, the Derby Scheme, and the men who would result from it in the army would be called the Derby Men, lots of derbies going around. This was generally overly confusing, the scheme that is, and to and basically, it was tr to try and figure out how many men would volunteer if they were directly asked. In the summer of 1915, each man of military age in Britain had been given an identification card. These were pink cards created by the National Registration Act. The essence of the Derby scheme was to have a government representative go around to every single man registered under this act and ask them to their face, whether or not they would volunteer. They had to answer themselves. Nobody else could answer for them. There were all kinds of caveats to what that volunteering would entail, like a guarantee that there would be two-week notice before they would be called up, and the fact that single men would come before married men, and these were just a few. There was a whole, There's a whole list of them. If the men said yes, they had to report to the recruiting office within 48 hours to report that they were ready to volunteer However, they were often escorted there directly, and once they were there, they would say I was ready to volunteer and that they would be ready to be called up should their country need them. Men could just say no to this scheme, and many did. About 38% of single and 54% of married men did just that. If they did not decline, or they were part of the nationally, rec nationally recognized war industry, or if they were deemed medically unfit, then they were given an armband to designate that they were willing to fight, even if they couldn't for one reason or another. As I'm sure you can imagine, this created a huge amount of social pressure, as everybody who said no would be easily identifiable, and this was not at all by accident. Overall, though, the Derby scheme, while drumming up some volunteers, which would come to be called the Derby men, was not a long-term solution to British manpower issues. And much like with the volunteers, all that it produced was a short-term spike in enlistments, which did not stand the test of time. All of these manpower problems came to a head in late January 1916, and the government was forced to pass the Military Service Bill, which specified that men aged 18 to 41 who were singled or widowed without children could be called up at any time. There were several groups that were not initially liable to be called up in the initial stages, like married men with children, uh, widowed men with children, or those in wartime industries. However, over time, these exemptions would slowly be whittled away, with the first to go being married men later on in 1916. This new act caused some resentment among the populace, with a big sticking point being that there was not universal male suffrage at this point, and there wouldn't be until 1918, and those without the right to vote were none too happy that they were being called to serve. This and other reasons resulted in a no-show rate as high as 30% for men who were called up under the Military Service Bill in 1916. 
Those who were called up had the option of appealing to a military service tribunal, and these were heavily used, with about 750,000 men choosing to appeal. Most of these men were given some form of exemption by the tribunals, whether it be a temporary or a conditional time period built around some situation at work or home, which is usually what they claimed as the reason they couldn't go. It varied tremendously. These tribunals also heard cases for conscientious objectors, although this was a huge minority of the cases that were heard during the war. In terms of the exact number of men brought into the army via conscription, the numbers seem a bit fuzzy, at least from the sources that I have, with the problem being that men volunteering after 1916 were attesting under the Derby scheme all got counted in the total number of new soldiers, along with the conscripts, which was around 1.5 million. So the actual number of conscripts in the British Army was probably reasonably close to the upper range of that number. Overall, it represented a big step for the British society and something that they would have to come back to uh, in 1940. The final topic of discussion today is that throughout the war, there were multiple attempts by one side or the other to initiate some form of peace talks. These could be in the form of an influential political member reaching out to the other side personally or through official channels. These efforts are often forgotten because they, of course, failed. However, they are important to discuss because it shows that both sides started to want peace, but only on their terms, which is where the holdup would be. However, there was another more hidden holdup to these sorts of talks, in the forms of the countries themselves being able to properly define their own goals, let alone how those would interact with other nations. War aims or war goals are an amorphous thing that fluctuate over time, as a country's fortunes rise and fall in a war, in any war, and because of this, they are constantly discussed and reevaluated in those countries and between the various political entities and by individuals in those groups as well. These discussions could cause a good amount of internal friction, as each group jockeyed with the other for priority on the list. I do not think it's necessarily important to run down the views of each of these groups and each of these countries, especially at this stage of the war, when the results did not really map to what actually happened at the end. But let's just jump into one group and talk about them in some level of detail. And for the purposes of this episode, I've chosen the German Navy, which I've chosen because I'm hoping nobody out there is a real expert on the war aims of the German Navy, so hopefully this will be enlightening. This group and its leadership had certain goals that they wanted to accomplish throughout the war. Specifically, they wanted to find a way to bring their abilities as close to that of the Royal Navy as possible. Because of this, they had a full list of demands to try and accomplish this goal, with the first item being the retaining of the Belgian ports that they currently had under their command, places like Bruges, Ostend, Zeebruges. All of these were in German hands during the war, and the German Navy saw it as a way to gain far better access to the North Sea. They then also wanted the Faroe Islands, naval bases in Dakar, the Cape Verde Islands, the Azores, and then they wanted control of Madagascar. All of these demands had an obvious purpose. The German Navy wanted the facilities to allow them to protect their naval power around the world much more easily. Instead of running into situations like with uh, Admiral Spee in 1915, where he had to go all the way around the world just to find a German port. This would put them in a much better position should another war break out with Britain and the Royal Navy, which was always a possibility. Looking back on these demands, all of them that I've just listed, they seem a bit crazy. But in the time frame we are talking about in late 1916, they were somewhat attainable, or they appeared that they were, because at the end of 1916, the Germans were sort of at the height of their power during the war. They still thought that they would be dictating the peace terms. And just these, just the Navy set of demands, would have been about all Germany could have expected from the war. It had a whole list of big ticket items. And this caused friction, as each of these groups inside of Germany and inside each of these countries had similar lists with similar big-ticket items, 
and this caused friction as each of them wanted their list to take priority for their own reasons. The German army had a similar list with different things on it. This could create an issue where even when a person like Bethman Holweg wanted to enter some kind of peace talks, he could not get the other political and military leaders to agree on what Germany's war aims list was, even if they did want to provide that to the Entente. This issue did not stop all peace talk attempts, though, and there were many of these. So I just want to make it clear that the instances that I'm about to discuss here are not a full and comprehensive listing, but attempts were initiated by both sides. So, for example, in October 1916, Bethman Holweg sent messages to all of the European neutrals in which he said that Germany was prepared to negotiate. In this invitation to the negotiating table, he did not put any conditions, which had been a big sticking point in previous efforts. But even even with this fact in mind, all of the Entente members rejected the offer. The big reason that they did this was because in his invitation, Bethman Holweg had not specifically addressed Belgium. This omission by the Germans was not an accident. Bethman Holweg knew that on the German side, both the army and the navy were adamant that Belgium remain either annexed by Germany completely or at least a German satellite state. He knew that mentioning this would have caused an instant rejection because the Entente were all pretty adamant that Belgium had to be a free and independent state after the war. The issue here, and with all of the peace talks that were discussed on an official level at least, even those proposed by President Truman in December 1916, was that there were a few things that both sides believed to be completely off the table when it came time to compromise. For the Entente, it was the removal of all Germans from Belgium and France, the restoration of Serbia and Montenegro as independent countries, and the payment of reparations by the Central Powers as the aggressors in the war. There were many more beside these, but these were some of the big ones, and they were more than enough to keep Germany from coming to the table. So what would happen is that one side would not even be open to the discussions without the other specifically stating that they would give in to some of these demands, but the other side would see this as compromising before they even got to the table and would of course not do it. It was never going to lead to a good compromise. Even back-channel efforts that were sort of not burdened by all of these official problems, like those launched by Emperor Karl uh, when he came to power in 1916 during which he tried to start indirect negotiations with France through his wife's brother, Prince Sixtus of Bourbon, was a failure, even though all he was trying to do was get the French to give him the terms under which they would accept a peace. Overall, all of these problems were caused by the fact that both sides, in 1916 and throughout 1917, still believed that they could win, and as long as they believed that they could win, They saw no point in not being able to demand their terms. Just to bring this around to why I'm including this in the first episode of this year's episodes is because a critical piece of the 1917 story and into 1918 is how all of the countries involved would be pushed closer and closer to the brink of collapse, which logically, you might think, would cause them to become more amenable to negotiation, but it would actually have the opposite effect. As all the countries were pushed further and further, their citizens were pushed further and further as well, and and more and more was asked of them for the war effort. And because of this, it became more difficult, instead of less difficult, for the politicians to show any sign of weakness, or any sign that they might lose because that would mean that they had made a mistake and they'd been asking for these sacrifices for nothing, which no politician would ever want to do. On that rather bleak note, I think it's time to end. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next week as we spend a bunch of time discussing changes at Army headquarters for France and Germany.